Hello everyone, Salim Barahmi here from PIPD. I want to welcome you to another episode of Dardashe, a series where we talk at length with amazing and inspiring Palestinians about their lives and the work that they do. Today we're joined by the amazing Gorilla Jibril, award-winning journalist, foreign policy expert, professor, and a G7 gender equality advisor. Gorilla, it's so lovely to have you with us. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. How are you holding up? How are things in these very surreal times? I mean, uh, I'm personally okay. It's just very painful to be separated from people who you love. I have family in Italy, I have family in Palestine, I have family, uh, and uh, some of those family members died. And uh, the, only, the only thing about this virus, it reminds me of a war zone where it's, it's like there's a sniper. You don't mm -hmm. see him. There's this threat, you know, that there's this threat, but by the time it hits you, it's already too late. Yeah. So I have these family members in the old city of Jerusalem who've been, you know, who died and um, only, I mean, there's no dignity even to the kind of death because they have to be buried quickly, quickly, quickly. And you can't do any funeral. There's no closure. And, um, I zoomed this morning to two funerals, basically, where there is this body in Italy that was cremated. And uh, the only thing that there is there for all of us, friends and, and loved ones, is a Zoom with, yeah. to say last goodbye. And with, with, the, with Jerusalem, I'm even more worried because all my relatives live in a very small space in the old city in Babel Majlis. And there's thousands, thousands of people in the old city, Palestinians, and they're denied basic right to health care. They're like, you know, Israel control their lives and rule their lives, but they're excluded from all the benefits because the benefits mm. are uh, racially oriented. I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, it's terrible that you have to mourn and, and, and be there through Zoom. I think it's, it's absolutely terrible. And uh, yeah, people don't know that, you know, Jerusalem is completely unequal in terms of the services and the support that, uh, that people get, whether it depends on whether you're Jewish or Palestinian. And uh, they told the Palestinian residents of Jerusalem, figure it out on your own, basically. During, Absolutely. Uh, Not while they're oppressing them, they're yeah. telling them, they basically want Palestinians to to capitulate completely. And you know, the narrative in the West that Jerusalem, oh, united capital. What united capital? It's a joke. I mean, Palestinians live under poverty line because they're stripped of anything. I mean, if I think of my neighborhood uh, growing up, we were already uh, packed in one small space, mm. uh, but they denied permission to build. They denied permission to rent houses in, in other neighborhoods or Jewish neighborhoods. I mean, there's a law. They even enshrine their races in law. They legislate. I mean, the whole politics of Israel, of any party, except, you know, the Arab parties, which is the, the joint Arab list, it's all about enshrining segregation, discrimination, racism mm. in laws. There's so many laws. Imagine if you tell an American citizen where I am now, well, you're black, you can't live in this neighborhood. I mean, you will take that case to the Supreme Court. In Israel, you take it to the Supreme Court, which some people did. Guess what? After years, there was one case of this nurse uh, he served in Israeli hospital for years and then he bought a house to improve because he knew that there's better schools in this Jewish neighborhood and he bought a house there. There was an uprising against having a Jew one Arab family in that area. So he took the case to the Supreme Court. The judge was so troubled to rule in his favor, even though it was obvious that yeah. he already bought the land and the house. He was so troubled and he said, yes, I'll rule in one case, except it will never be used as precedent. Like meaning every time we have to go to the Supreme Court, wait years. I'm like, who? It's, it's really, this is what it boils down to. Yeah. It's a racial segregationist supremacist system that benefits only one ethnic group. That's it. Everybody else is excluded. Mm. Since, since 1948, there hasn't been a new Palestinian village or city inside yeah. Israel. Yeah. Um, and the, the most inhumane, I mean, indicator of, yeah. of the way the system works is that even during a time where you need to be social distancing at home, they demolish your house and, you, and, and leave you homeless. 
And so it's, a, it's an incredibly disgusting and horrific system that is built on, on as you said, racial segregation. And it, they treat you on basis of on, on, on your ethnicity. And then they tell you, well, we need to defend ourselves. Like, against what exactly? Against an entire group of people whose their own existence represent a threat to you. And, and you know, the narrative in, in America and in the West oh, we need to destroy these homes because they're terrorists, whatever. I mean, the first, I, I mean, for 70 years, we lived under military occupation. Hamas was born in 87, I believe. And, and then now it's used as, as a, as a uh, scarecrow. It's like, oh, but Hamas, it's, it's always hiding behind Hamas to basically make Israel, you know, get away with so many of the atrocities. And the fact that we... Uh, the international community didn't hold Israel into account. What, what's happening is like any war, that war never, it's like the virus. People thought it will stay in Wuhan in China, never thought that it will travel and it will hit Paris, London, Madrid. Uh, like it will be a global thing. Exactly like the Iraq war and the Syrian war. They thought, oh, it will stay there geographically. Guess what? When you forbid and you prevent uh, and you allow atrocity to happen, guess what? It will come back and it's dismantling Israel democracy. Whatever, you know, charade of democracy they had for the Jewish majority or the Jewish people, it's gone. And we can see it. The first thing that Bibi Netanyahu did with this, uh, with the new unity government is to stop the courts where he is basically about to be indicted on corruption, fraud, on, on uh, abuse of office. I mean, the guy is a thug and is a crook, but he will appoint the police chief, he will appoint the judges. What, what, what a lot of people around the world don't realize is, is in the last few years, they've seen this surge of right-wing populism and fascism that is Bolsonaro, um, um, Orban, uh, Trump, Trump, et cetera. And they don't realize that that, that wave to, to extremist views has been dominant in Israel for a very long time and has been yes. taking the, the country in a, in a certain direction. Yes. And so a lot of the misinformation, the walls, the surveillance, the us against them, the ethno-nationalism, that's something we can really need. You know, hatred of one ethnic group never stop at one ethnic group, by the way. It mm. goes all the way. So I, my surprise is when I see people chanting here in America, Jews will not replace us, but blood and soul. White supremacist hmm? yeah. mm -hmm. who killed an American citizen, Heather Heyer, and those people go to Israel. It's like, oh, we stand with Israel. I'm like, wait one second. Because they think that the Israel they see now, which is an Israel that is, wants to enshrine supremacists. And yeah. basically, it's a project of exclusion and impurity, an ethno-religious project. This is exactly what it is. So they, they find this appealing, a lot yeah. of white supremacists, and it is scary because they're willing these same white supremacists to kill and march against Jews in Belgium, in Italy, in France, in America. But for them, Israel is actually a good state. Like, yeah, we don't want you Jews, go back there. And yeah. this is what Israel doesn't understand and cannot figure out. Yeah, they've, they've it, it's, it's made its alliances with some of, the scariest forces that exist at the moment around the world. And one example is, you know, a, a, a member of the, the Knesset, the Israeli par parliament from the Likud party, talking about Orban or Hungarian, you know, anti-Semites as being there, our Semites. They're okay, they are, they are our anti-Semites because they support Israel. And it's, it's horrific. And um, yeah. I think this, is, this makes the case for us as Palestinians that we need to be able to stand with, with the right side of history uh, and stand up for values that I know you stand up for and, and the advocate for a lot in your life, which is freedom, justice, equality, etc. We need to create a larger coalition and a larger coalition of humanists around the world. People who are dying in America, who are African Americans, Latinos and others, they're put there. I mean, we have kids in cages here in this country. Yeah. In this, I mean, the richest country, the most advanced democracy, we have kids in cages. So this is where, I mean, the separation will come down to that between humanists, people who we need to be allies with, who we need to cooperate with and stand by. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, you know, something that I found interesting that I'm sure you've also encountered in your life 
uh, you know, when you lived abroad and all around the world, is people are confused when they meet Palestinians that preach this message. Yeah. And they don't understand how Palestinians inherently stand for progress. A lot of us stand for progressive values because our national struggle for freedom, et cetera, is based in progressive values. And so I wanted, I wanted to take us back on your journey to, to how you were able to, how these values were formed within you, right? Um, you grew up in Jerusalem, you, you're Palestinian, you're a woman, you're part of the Afro-Palestinian community, which is a minority within a minority, yes. and extremely oppressive circumstances. So tell, I mean, tell us how that was like for you and how that led you to where uh. you are. So I grew up in three realities, to be honest, in Jerusalem, but in the two Jerusalem, uh, the one in the old city and the one outside the old city. The one in the old city was my neighborhood. Uh, that was an amazing place where women were, were ruling the place, uh, even conservative women. Um, and we're, I mean, we're, we are overwhelming majority. We're very close to the mosque, very close to the church, to the Wailing Wall, yet we were so secular. So that the roots of, um, that I grew up with are not really religious roots. They're very conservative, uh, humanist roots. The battle for freedom. I mean, I remember reading, we had a club uh, in my neighborhood called the Club Il Nadi, where young uh, people would meet, boys and girls, and would meet and discuss ideas. And suddenly we opened the club and then we had people from other neighborhoods, like the Armenian neighborhoods and Christian neighborhoods, coming and visiting. And I remember uh, one of the elderly was sitting, uh, you know, next to the neighborhood and he looked at me and he said, who's this white boy? <laughs> and that's my first experience was like, I didn't see color. I was like, I was color blind. But he, for him, he was shocked because he was telling me, he's like, who's this white boy? And he said, like, he's our neighbor uh, from the Armenian neighborhood. And he said, and he wants, why is he here? I said, well, he comes here to discuss ideas and, and debate, you know, the first intifada and all of that. He said, you know, this is the first time I see a white person here. They used to boycott us. They wouldn't sell us things. And I was wow. like, it shook me to my core, his experience. And I, I start wondering, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 60% Palestinian, but the rest, 40%, actually, I did my genetic test, and, and 40% is Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and, mm. and it's like a lot of countries in Africa, and I was like, oh my God, that's genetic map and journey is incredible. Yeah. So, uh, but also I remember uh, hearing comments about Afro-Palestinians that were horrific, and, and our neighbor, another neighbor who was a political activist, he was an incredibly charming man, a leader, uh, respected, admired, loved um, Ali Jiddeh. He was denied uh, the request to marry a girl because he was black. The family said, we love you and respect you, but no, 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 we're not going to make you marry our, our daughter. That was in the 80s, by the way. And so, when I grew up, that was the environment. I was, it was different a little bit because I would, you know, sometimes I would look at them and I was like, but you're not like them. You're not very black. And you have a very, uh, you know, soft features. And I, was, I was shocked to my core when I hear these comments. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they really, it, but it was within the Palestinian community. And then you have on top of that, the Israeli secular and religious racism. Uh, so I was, you know, we were truly discriminated against. Um, when I go back, Salim, to Jerusalem, I love to see the walls. I love to see the neighborhoods. But what I love the most to see the diverse communities melting within each other. Mm -hmm. The one symbol of oppression that's still there in Jerusalem, wherever I see it, my skin crawls, is the police station, in Muscovy, yeah. where the police would come and arrest children, children. Uh, at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. And I remember here where I saw women activists. So women who, was, who were, you know, often very shy, very, you know, delicate, very, some of them were, were you know, would wear the veil. Many of them basically became like a tiger when they would come arrest their children. I remember one episode that was 14 years old. Mm. And at two o'clock in the morning, uh, I hear I was sleeping, deeply sleeping, because I remember it was the weekend visiting my dad. 
uh, and I had school the next day and I woke up, jumped from the bed because the screaming seemed like, like somebody was, was killing somebody. And I, we all jumped out of our beds and everybody from the neighborhood came out to the courtyards. And we mm -hmm. saw three soldiers trying to arrest this kid, our neighbor, who was 12 years old. And his mother, who was this hijabi woman, very honestly, I, I, even when I, she talked, I had to go close to her just because her voice was very low, screaming. And she would not allow him to arrest the child. She would not allow him. So like, you want to interrogate him, call him in the morning, I'll bring him there, I'll be there with a lawyer, but don't tell me that you need to take him, terrorize him and take him out. Mm -hmm. and, he did not arrest him because all the other women jumped at the police and they kicked him out. So the police came back the next day and he wanted to talk to the head of the neighborhood, the Mukhtar. And they had a meeting with him. And I remember I didn't go to school because the whole neighborhood was traumatized by that experience. And the Mukhtar was meeting with them and we were, you know, like he was not meeting with them inside his house, but in the courtyard, in the main courtyard where we all gathered. And, um, I remember Al Mukhtar listening to the police chief, and the police chief said, Listen, look at his face. He's full of scratches. Look what they did to him. So I, and I remember looking at the, the policeman and, and the soldier, and they were armed, and mm -hmm. their faces were like scratched, like as if the, like a cat jumped at their faces. And I thought, Wow, that's something. And he was talking to the Mukhtar. He said, Mukhtar, we don't want to beat this woman up. We need you to rein these women. And Mukhtar mm. looked at him and said, can you repeat that again? <laughs> and he said, uh, we need you to rein these women. It's your job. He said, it's my job? You don't understand. You are an armed man asking an older man in his 80 to rein these women. I, I'm scared of them. You want to rein them, talk to them directly, but don't tell me that I need to rein them. If you're hiding behind me, man, you have to change strategy. I mean, like we start laughing and this is the first time I saw women leadership. I yeah. saw them taking over. I saw the fearlessness. The, the, and from that on, day on, I was like, I'm not going to be scared and I will never allow fear to rule my life. But then yeah. I have other lives, the one in the orphanage mm. where I grew up between five and 18. I wanted to ask you about racism within Palestinian community as an Afro-Palestinian and that, how that impacted you personally and how did that manifest itself? How did you, how did it affect you? Um, I'm sure it was, it was a terrible thing to encounter from a very young age. Well, I mean, obviously the first thing you see is Israeli racism and mm -hmm. it impacts you deeply because it really makes you feel that your your life is threatened like yeah. you're, you're, there's an existential crisis that you can never be safe anywhere and you are uh, eager and hungry for freedom but i thought we need to free ourselves from our prejudices mm -hmm. yes the israelis had a lot of prejudice whatever but there's a deep prejudice against brown skin black skin dark skin and it it was you know growing up in jerusalem and, and coming to an age during the first intifada, obviously a lot of, the first intifada changed a lot of things. To be honest, mm -hmm. it was an equalizer. But mm -hmm. before that, I mean, the first intifada started when I was 15. And, you know, it kicked in when I was 14, but then 15 when it really took off. But between uh, five and 15, I remember, you know, the, the, the looks, you know, mm. just the unspoken words, uh, not more, I mean, not even towards me a lot, but towards people who are my neighbors, my family members. I mean, I remember in Haifa also, I, I used to spend the summers in my family home in Haifa. My mother was from Haifa, so we would spend the summer there. Mm. And my aunt uh, would take me with her sometimes to work, um, or, or I would go with her you know, grocery shopping and other things. And I remember the comments, especially, and it's really horrific because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a racism that I understood that was racism later on towards women. And women are subjected to that. So the, the, the idea that a black woman is more, uh, there's, there's something about her, her sensuality 
Mm. So I remember comments uh, from, uh, you know, in the streets, walking with my aunt and my aunt, and I would be horrified. Uh, and I would look at my aunt and I was like, and my aunt would be looking at the floor and not, not talking. And she's a strong woman, but mm. she would tell me, you know, they would never make these comments to a white woman. But yeah. they have, there's all of these stereotypes about black women. And then the same thing I witnessed in America with black men. I remember sitting in, a, in, a, in a, an event and I was sitting with this Hollywood actor, uh, an African man, and, and it was a human right watch dinner. And a white woman came from the other table, put her hand on his shoulder and he said, my dream is to marry a black man. And my jaw dropped. Oh, wow. And I, she didn't say, my dream is to marry an amazing man. I'm great. His skin tone was, and I looked at him, I'm like, I was so embarrassed for her, but also for him. And he looked at me, so you know how many white women come to me and they see in me this? I, po the police look at me with suspicion. Some people hide their purses. I mean, even President Obama was giving the key to park, to park, in, to park a car, I, I believe five years before he came, became president. So mm -hmm. imagine these experiences in Palestine. Imagine in the 80s or the 70s. I mean, in the 80s, I remember walking with my father and a man asked my father, said, is your wife white? And he looked at me. Yeah. It's just, it's, I find it repugnant, to be honest. And I think yeah. it's not addressed enough. It's hidden, it's in the shadows. It's, and you can see it between, I mean, if you ever go to a mixed marriage in Jerusalem, or I mean, it's less now, to be honest, but it used to be, you would have the white people sitting on one side and the black people sitting on the other side. And you would see like, what the hell is going on here? So the first intifada arrived and it really broke all the rules because the younger generation, my generation, basically didn't want to accept any of those rules, any of the social norms, any of these prejudices, any of these, I mean, we're fighting a racist ideology, Zionism. We cannot be enacting at the same time another racist behavior and, and norms towards our own people. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it ter it's terrible and it blows my mind. I, when, you, when you're fighting a struggle for freedom that you have the, the, you have the, 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 the drive to, to discriminate against your own as well, right? Based on, yeah. on, on color. And I, I saw that quite a lot because I, I grew up in Jericho and I spent a lot of time in Jericho and that, that all, Jericho has an afro palestinian community as well and I saw how intermarriage sometimes was frowned down upon and it was it was something that was horrible and um, yeah. yeah and it's something that divides yeah. us and, and we don't have the luxury to divide uh, and, and make each other to be um, alien in a way um, which is yeah. very sad I wanted to ask you Israel has a very specific set of policies that it, it places on the Afro-Palestinian community in Jerusalem. I mean, the, the, the types of checkpoints and, 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 and surveillance and what is that yeah. like? What was that like growing up and how, is your, like, well, how does your family deal with it on a daily basis? That deteriorated after the second intifada. And, uh, that deteriorated after the first and the second intifada. But yeah. before that, uh, the checkpoints, remember, the checkpoints start happening when uh, Ariel Sharon decided to buy a house in Jerusalem. Where? In our neighborhood. It's like if all places, <laughs> it's like the most outrageous provocation. I mean, dude, you want to live in Jerusalem. He already had, by the, by the way, a house, I think, outside of the wall of the city. But he wanted the, most, the, the Muslim neighborhood as a provocation. He put a flag of Israel, three meters flag. And, and I'm like, in our neighborhood. And I remember the guy that sold him the house, a Palestinian guy, was, was hated, obviously, by everybody. Not because, I mean, Ariel Sharon is the symbol of our oppression. The guy that led the massacre of Sabra Shatila. The guy that watched the, the Maronites slaughtering million, you know, thousands of children and women and unarmed after, after they were promised the PLO to leave to Tunisia and, and, and 
you know, and they were promised protection, by the way, uh, Philip mm. Habib and from, by the Americans and many others. Like, yeah, you leave, we'll take care of the camps, we'll take care of the civilians. Yeah, they took care of them so well that 3,000 were slaughtered in cold blood. Ariel Sharon was a symbol of that. So imagine Ariel Sharon in the 80s coming and living in our neighborhood. Wow. And this is when we start seeing the checkpoints. And I remember every time he would come on Saturday and, and the whole neighborhood would close down. There would be thousands of militaries in the streets. Mm. So he would walk in the old cities. And I remember my father used to take us. So we'd go see my father because I lived in the orphanage most of the, during the week. And we'll see my father in the weekend. And I remember one of the soldiers stopping my father. He saw us because they were the same soldiers. They would change them, like they were take them, but the same guy, because I remember seeing him before. He would stop my father every time, would ask for his ID. My father would give him the ID. And often he would drop the ID on the floor. Just to humiliate my dad and get him to mm -hmm. bend on his knees to his foot. And I remember this is where I developed my instinct reaction. So I, I would just jump at the ID, take the ID, give it to my dad. I said, dad, let's go. We're late. And I was, I believe, eight or, or nine. And, and I remember the face of the soldier because he did not expect a reaction from a little girl. And obviously it confused him. In the same time, I remember growing up slowly, slowly and watching this pig and coming back and looking into his eyes every time. And I would see hate, pure hate. Mm. I was a child, but I remember recognizing the hate in his face. Um, yeah. and, and, and it was, you know, to see how would, you know, they would decide the city have to close down, shut down, even during Ramadan or Friday or whatever, that if you want to one day, to pray, you come from, I don't know, Ramallah, Nablus, or Janina, or other places, they can forbid you. It's like you walk hours and hours, like these old ladies, and who wants maybe to sit in the gardens of the mosque. I mean, they didn't even want to pray, maybe, just to have a moment of freedom in these amazing, stunning gardens. And they were denied. They were denied basic freedom. And, and I thought, reading all these, uh, you know, literature about South Africa. This is no different from South Africa. This is no different mm -hmm. from any other apartheid state. And I start reading more and more. And I, I came into an age where Nelson Mandela was released and became president. And I remember him reading about children in his poem of Ingrid Junger. Uh, the mm -hmm. child is not dead. The child is still alive. And I, I wonder still now, is the child dead or alive in our struggle? Because I yeah. see a lot of dead children in my memory and in my, in my present, but also in my past. Yeah, it's, it's, ter it's horrific. I think generations of Palestinians have grown up with trauma uh, yeah. from, from experience, whether it's exile, whether it's, it's things like that, the humiliation of your father at a young age, because soldiers set up a checkpoint because an Israeli general wants to live next door. It's, yeah. it's a never-ending cycle. You have, you have a unique experience and perspective. Um, there's Palestinian society is fragmented, uh, and this is a policy uh, that Israel uh, has been pursuing for decades. Um, and so you had the chance to experience what life was like in Jerusalem, but also spend some time in Haifa and understand the Palestinian community uh, you know, in 48 with the citizens of Israel, um, how, how, what, what did you make of that as, as someone who was growing up? How did you see that struggle? Uh, how did you see that community? So before I go there, if I may, I want to touch on growing up in, in uh, East Jerusalem, but outside the walls, because that actually hmm. can, can explain Haifa different yeah. and more. So between age five and 18, I lived uh, all my weekdays, except the summer where I go to Haifa, in uh, the orphanage. The orphanage was, was, was an institution built by Hint Hosseini, this woman, Palestinian amazing woman, who decided to transform her wealth and family homes into an orphanage, into a school, and a boarding school, uh, and then to even a university. She built a university. Wow. She raised thousands of girls. I was among them. 
And her strategy was simple. Education is the best weapon we can have to empower our, you know, our women so they can conquer the world. Like she had, her ambition would reach the sky. I mean, like I would, she would say things. I was like, you know, there's no limits mm. to your ambition and dreams. She just really fueled those, uh, the confidence. She injected us with confidence, with, with, and she, you know, her motto was simple. Uh, every girl was in charge of taking care of, like, for example, when I was 10, I was in charge of taking care of the, 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 the girls who are eight. If I was 15, I'm in charge of taking the girls who are four and five. But yeah. I remember I, de I developed um, a, a skill and the skill was telling stories. Mm -hmm. So every night, all the girls from age, uh, when I was even five, every night would, would sleep, but every night somebody would tell their own story. And there were always dramatic, horrific stories of violence, extreme violence, rape, murder. Like, wow. They really were nightmares. Um, mm -hmm. But then I remember when I was 12, I was put in charge of the girls who were eight. And suddenly I would tell them, go to the room, seven, there's no lights. I would stand in the middle of the room, so like, okay, close your eyes. And I will start telling stories. And I remember I start telling stories about heroes women about uh gardens because i love gardens and i love nature and i love and building cities green cities and the cities are ruled by women like we are in the orphanage but even better and mm. and like, i would tell them amazing story and suddenly one of the my teachers she said i have a problem every class wants you to go there so i was in charge suddenly of five rooms and i yeah. had to go in seven to 7.15, 7.20, I was in another room, and I would put these girls to sleep. Um, so what I did, I instinctively understood that we need to shift the narrative to positive stories. Yeah. And at 14, during the first intifada, you know, at 15, then all the schools shut down in the refugee camps. So our mentor, teacher, Hind Husseini, who really wanted to build citizen, not while well, everybody was building armies and resistance, she wanted to build citizen and the next generation of leaders. She would send us to refugee camps to open, reopen the schools. So I was sent to these refugee camps and for three years, I would go to all these refugee camps for weeks, 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 months, 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 months to teach kids how to speak English. And I was in charge of English and, and, and some classes of math. Not that I was good in math, but I tried. It was basic math. And we'd go to the refugee camps, and this is the experience that shaped my life and my existence. Yeah. The oppression in the refugee camps in Amari, Dheshe. I remember arriving to a refugee camp, and maybe half an hour after they destroyed the house. So I could see that the house was destroyed. I saw the old lady looking for her a mother, grandmother looking for her medication. And a child, he was maybe seven, sitting on the rubbles, looking in, in the emptiness, and his eyes were, were deep sadness, but more than that, there was something dead there. Mm -hmm. They killed that child. They yeah. killed his, his future, his hopes. He was so traumatized, looking at his mother, running to, to grab a couple of pictures. They would give them 10 minutes to, to go out of the house and then would destroy the house. You could see the soldiers still standing there laughing and smiling. You could see the settlers standing behind them, like rubbing their, like, oh. I mean, the dehumanization, the oppression of that image forged the activist and reshaped the act. The activist was born in those mm -hmm. camps out of that sense of deep injustice and inhumanity, cruelty. It just, it's just so cruel to destroy yeah. the life of people as collective punishment. Yeah. And this is my love and passion for laws and for, for cooperation, but also for justice and also for telling the stories. Because yes, I would tell the girls nice stories to put them to sleep and heal them maybe, but I wanted the world to know the story of that boy. I wanted, when Nelson Mandela talked about the boy, that he's not dead. I remember the, um, the boy 
hiding behind his father in the second intifada. I don't remember that image. Yeah. Hiding Hamad, yeah. Hamad, who was shot. I mean, that image, I'll never forget that image. Yeah. Because that image I see multiple times in the refugee camps. Children shot intentionally by snipers and, and killed. And you see that the hopelessness of the family, of the community, of, of just, they killed hope. And while they were, you know, basically ethnically cleansing the Palestinians, they were arguing internationally that they are defending themselves. There was no terrorism during the first intifada, yet mm -hmm. they always treated us like terrorists. And I recognized that when I would go to Haifa. Mm -hmm. So in Haifa, where I touch on another side of me, in Haifa, my family lived, you know, a middle-class family who lived in, in a beautiful neighborhood, yet, you know, their activism was through arts, through the theater on Haifa, where, where I remember reading books that were given to me, like Norit Pellet book, uh, education. Um, so basically, it's, it's propaganda in, in, um, in the education system in, in Israel, where Arabs mm -hmm. always were referenced to as Bedouins, as yeah. farmers without, without nationality or as terrorists, always. But also I remember the struggle within the Palestinian community who thought, you know, they were looked at by other Palestinian communities outside Palestine and, 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 and inside Palestine as the lost tribe, no? It's like, mm. oh, that, those are the lost tribe. But then something changed with the second intifada in 2000, where 13, 13 citizens were killed in cold blood without doing anything, for simply protesting. And that criminal act let Palestine, create a Palestinian awakening from within. Mm. So they had organizations like Adala and others who start looking at the law, discriminatory laws. And we mm. realized, you know, in Israel, it doesn't matter your, your, ethnic, your, your citizenship. Your ethnicity and your religion will always trump democracy and will mm. always trump uh, basically any right. It doesn't matter. Your ethnicity, what matters in Israel? It's an ethno-religious state of purity and exclusion. So we start looking at the laws. And I remember being, you know, looking at these activists who, who try to strike down all these racist laws and, 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 and frame the conversation in terms of equal rights. Um, and I remember being impressed with their level of, or, you know, how they would organize and how would they, you know, have very educated people arguing in the Supreme Court against these mm -hmm. discriminatory, racist, segregationist laws. And it reminded me of the struggle, the African-American struggle here and my mm -hmm. heroes like Thurgood Marshall and others who, who led the fight to change these laws. In America, nobody would reinstate segregation in schools. We have segregation schools. We have house segregations. We have segregations even in, in distribution of, of, of funds. The city of, of, of Haifa, the city of Nazareth, they get almost zero funds compared to big Jewish majority cities. You know, they, they also, I mean, it's so blatant. They're not even hiding it. They don't mm. care about hiding it anymore. And this yeah. is, I think, what I learned from Haifa. I learned that my community in Haifa decided to expose, I mean, when, when, when they call Israeli democracy in the, in the land, in the territories, 1948, there's no democracy anywhere. When you kill 13 of your citizens simply because they're Palestinians, when you discriminate against them, when you have a minister who came from Russia, by the way, Lieberman, and, and he has more rights, and then he goes out and he said, we need to behead Palestinians. I mean, yeah. these are the stories that are not told for, to the international community. Or the international mm -hmm. community basically look, is looking the other way. Until mm -hmm. now, they look the other way. Until that monster of racism came back to haunt them too. Yeah, it's, and I think we've spoken about this before, but um, a lot of people around the world think it's a very complex issue. And it really isn't, right? No. You have, 18 million people that live between the river and the sea and you get you get a set of laws and rules uh depending on your ethnicity 
And each Palestinian community, whether it's the, the, in 48, whether it's uh, in Jerusalem, whether it's in Gaza or West Bank or refugees, you have a different struggle, but it's still a struggle. And you encapsulated a lot of those struggles in your personal stories. And at the moment, we look at this reality, and it's a, it's a one-state reality. Israel controls every aspect of our life. And so for a long time, we pursued a very specific political platform and project, which is two states for two people living in peace and security side by side. Obviously, if you look at a map, you understand that there's no such thing. You know, Israel has built settlements all over the West Bank and has marginalized Palestinian rights and freedom even more every day. Too many generations have suffered this and we don't have the, the privilege to ever let up. Um, and I think we need to all continue in our own way, as you say, build coalitions with the world, share our stories. I know uh, a big part of your life is being in the media. And you went to Italy, you, you studied there, and then you had a, a really amazing career, still have an amazing career within the media. How is that like as a Palestinian woman um, navigating the media in Italy, navigating the media in the US? So I... Uh... I wasn't supposed to study journalism or media, but that was always my passion. Um, since, you know, witnessing these atrocities in the camps. Uh, but my family, like all the Palestinian families, like you need to find, you need to study something that where you can find immediately a job. Doctor, the, lawyer. <laughs> doctor, lawyer, architect, whatever. But just, you need to find a job. You need to become independent economically. Yeah. Um, and I remember my aunt saying, you know, just leave all the, the intellect, because I used to read a lot. And I was like, mm. really? Uh, you don't understand. You'll never make money uh, by being an intellectual. Books don't sell. Um, and, and articles don't sell. And, and talking, just, it's a waste of time. So I went to study political science. And I went to study, actually, to become a lawyer. And she said, like, no way you will be a lawyer anywhere. Like, forget it. And one day, I remember I was in Jerusalem and I witnessed the killing of our neighbor, Osama, mm -hmm. in the mosque. He was protesting peacefully and he was shot. And I remember that going to the funeral and I remember I used to be sit for that kid. So I came back wow. to Italy and I was really depressed and I was watching television one night and suddenly they were talking about Israel, Palestine. I was horrified. I was like, what the mm -hmm. hell are they talking about? It's pure propaganda. It was the Israeli talking point being pre repeated over and again, uh, overlooking Sharon responsibility of going around the mosque and overlooking the settlements, the numbers. It's like, oh, we gave them the country. It's like, you didn't give us sovereignty. You didn't give us freedom. You didn't give us anything. You had never intention to give us that. And they were putting all these Israeli uh, leaders on television. A lot of them spoke fluent Italian, fluent English. Mm -hmm. And they would not put one Palestinian. And I was like, what the hell? So I called the network the next day. And I, I was yelling at the woman. I said, this is not journalism. Journalism, I mean, like, what kind of journalism is that? This is pure propaganda. She said, Rula, I'm sorry. We cannot find a Palestinian person who will come speak. The ambassador mm -hmm. doesn't speak Italian. He speaks Arabic. We don't have translators. It's like, it was a disaster. And I said, well, I'll give you the name of Hanan Ashrawi. I'll give you her number. I remember Hanan being on CNN, very articulate. She led the peace talks. Mm. And while they were trying to depict us as these fanatics, terrorists, Muslims, bearded guys, mm. oppressed women, like really, the hum total dehumanization. Yeah. So she invited Hanan, but then she called me. She said, look, let me be honest with you. I can invite this woman, but between the translation, the connection from Ramallah, you will lose uh, basically the momentum and we will not convey the narrative that needs to be conveyed about yeah. who, Palis who the Palestinians are. Can you come on television? And I was like, oh God, I never thought of that. And I, I said, give me half an hour. <laughs> I remember <laughs> calling, my, calling my sister and saying, you know, they asked me to do this. My sister from Haifa, she said, yeah, of course, do it. You were born to do it. You always debated everywhere. Like, go and do it on television. What's the difference? It's just you debating on camera instead of, you know, breaking my back and debating everybody in the family. <laughs> so I went on air and I remember arriving there. I was wearing something similar, a white suit. And the producer came to the room and he said, where is that Palestinian woman? We're late. I looked at him and said, 
which Palestinian woman? He said, Rula Jibreel. And I said, oh, that's me. And I could see the shock in his eyes. Like, you? You're, you're not Brazilian? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you're not wearing a veil? I was like, I, all the stereotypes would come out. I was like, oh God, what's wrong with these people? Anyway, I went on air with Hanan Ashrawi. It was the year 2000. This is when my career picked up. And I was, you know, rationally, logically arguing against the host who had all these wrong talking points about how yeah. Palestinians don't want peace. I said, well, we, rec I was like, we don't recognize Israel. I said to him, you know that we recognize Israel in 1988. The Palestinian mm -hmm. National Council recognized Israel in 1988 at the highest of the, second intif at the first intifada. We recognized yeah. Israel again in 1993. We signed an agreement. Whoever torpedoed the peace process and the peace you know, arrangement is Israel itself because they never mm -hmm. had the intention to basically give us freedom. And I remember him looking at me like, and I said, you know, you cannot continue to deny these evidence these facts mm -hmm. and that, that are on file you're like because you're arguing against facts and i was debating him fiercely and i remember i got a phone call the next morning by the owner of the network he said would you like to work with us and wow. i didn't have the training so they trained me and i became you know their their uh i led the news i read the news and i had my own tv show and then i interviewed the prime minister one day and this is when my career picked up because it was a different kind of interview. Like everybody would interview him in a very differential way because Western journalists are very differential to authority. Mm -hmm. We brought up to fight authority, you know, to actually <laughs> stand up to authority. It took you back to your days in Jerusalem. Absolutely. So for me, grilling Berlusconi was a pleasure. Yeah. I mean, like I, I had such a pleasure. I mean, he was horrified. But also I remember him shaking my hands, coming to races, shaking my hand. He said, oh, wow, you have a strong hands. You must have worked the land. Oh, wow. And I said, excuse me, I beg your pardon? Like, he, it, it's come, I mean, he's the man that told Barack Obama, he said, he's tan and good looking, but he's tan. Do you remember those sentences? Like, I mean, it's unfiltered racism. But then when I pointed out during the interview that he was also a bigot, because he said Islam is an inferior civilization, he said to me, by the way, I never said that. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I have a video. Would you like to watch it? Let's watch the video. He said, no, 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 wait one second. Let's not watch it. Um, uh, then he said, I have an explanation. I never meant these words. And when he was explaining what he meant, it was even worse. I said, mm -hmm. Mr. Prime Minister, can you admit that that was a bigoted remark, apologize and walk away from it? He said, I have the proof that I'm not a bigot or racist. I said, what's the proof? He said, I dated Muslim women. And I honestly, Salim, I never was so speechless in my life, like in that interview. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, time to end this interview. And then, Barack Obama was elected. And this is when I wanted to come to America because mm -hmm. suddenly I saw hope. I saw a country teaching the rest of the world how to be fair to their minorities, how to be inclusive, how to open up the power structure system so they can be part of it. They can legislate mm -hmm. and in, a, in a fair, inclusive, democratic way. Rula, um, I wanted to ask you, yeah. what were some of the challenges you faced in that, in, in the US, in the US media environment, but also in the Italian media environment as a Palestinian, one that was offering a different narrative, that wasn't often heard. I'm sure that you were probably attacked, defamed, etc. Yeah, I was called a Taliban, which is really, uh, one headline was in a major newspaper that Berlusconi owns, uh, called me a Taliban. And I thought it was ironic, if not dangerous, because at that time, uh, Italian soldiers were fighting against the Taliban in Afghanistan. So to depict me as a threat soldiers yeah. are, the army is fighting against is an incitement against my, my person. Um, I remember my director uh, at the network, he was like, you're going to give me a heart attack. Every time you would see him, like, Rula. I get phone calls from politicians. After you interview them, they want, they want to strangle you. They, like, they want to fire you. They just, they, I keep receiving calls. 
he said, the only thing that's saving you, the ratings, you're so good. So the ratings are so good. We have a bunch of, you know, publicity and money and like, so we're good. But the moment the rating will go down one inch, you're fired. And I was oh, like, no. okay. And the ratings were fine. But what was really the, the pressure of these lobbyists and the Israeli embassy calling consistent, consistently, always, daily, to complain about something. So what they do to intimidate is they create a lobbying campaign, pressure campaign, online, offline, through their politicians, through their, their whatever surrogates, to attack you consistently. So after a while, you're too tired to fight back. Yeah. I actually chose to continue telling the truth because there's no bigger weapon than telling the truth. Did it affect and, you? Did it, like, did it affect you personally, like getting always attacked and, and et cetera? I mean, you become hardened a little bit after a while. I have no doubt. Uh, and I remember my dress code changed. I would dress more and more conservative, like a man almost. Uh, and I, I noticed that because I think my, uh, my sister pointed out, she's like, what happened to you? We, like, you know, start the, the show with a smile. You don't smile anymore. You're always mm -hmm. in, in trenches. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to allow them to do this. Yeah. And the way around it was to starve my, my, my uh, bigger critics and feed my bigger ambitions. So I changed, I changed uh, by writing, doing something also different, writing a book, writing a movie. So my strategy was around it. You don't yeah. want me to be on television speaking directly on the issues. I'll write a book speaking about the issues. I'll write a movie that will reach wider audience. So I just turn around the strategy. Um, but it's the same one, it's telling the truth, is, is yeah articulating our narrative so we can win the minds and hearts of people around the world and maybe some Israelis in, in this battle for freedom. I think we have uh, to use all the tools that we have at display. And in America, yes, it's even worse. Because in America, as much as in Europe, anyway, you have uh, an independent journalist that would verify facts and would hold Israel to account. I think the Israeli lobby focused on America because they thought, okay, we don't care about Europe, we'll focus on America. This is where America was totally brainwashed when it comes to Israel and Palestine. They mm. never, I mean, the way they interviewed the prime minister uh, of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, was so outrageous, was, oh, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, how do you feel? I, like, as if he's the victim. I never see a country that an occupying power demands from the people that occupy protection. And mm -hmm. when you say this on air, they were so outraged. And uh, many times, you know, attacked obviously by APAC, with even, you know, there was even emails that were leaked about their sexist remarks saying, yeah, she's successful because she's good looking. Mm -hmm. uh, they invite her. So they try to diminish, you know, but then when they start seeing many people on American television, Ayman Mohideen, Noura Iraqat, Yusuf Munayir and others, I think there is a moment of panic. It's like, oh wow, these guys can articulate themselves better than the older generation. And they can convey a message that is very similar to the African-American struggle, to the racist struggle here. Um, so for the first time in my life, I've seen democratic, uh, candidates, presidential candidates, and also senators boycotting APAC for the first time in decades. And that is a result of a campaign of awareness, campaign to make them see the truth. Yeah, and that's, and that's really important um, to be able to share our stories, whether it's through your book and amazing movie that's reached millions or able to break the stereotypes and the dehumanization for for we've been suffering for very long and uh, what what an inspiring story uh, and career you've had and thank you so much for sharing i really appreciate thank it thank you thank you sir. Habibi.